obsessed with photography, so I don't know how to entirely answer your question because the writings inform the work and, you know, it, I mean, you, we could have spent years and years and we just spent a long time just doing the required reading for this film and never actually made it. <laughs> secret, 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 <laughs> she didn't come down either. We've got a bunch of shy interviewees. Come on down, come on. I, I see you right there. Every good night. Open to the audience for questions, for sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, um, she also used the phrase so called documentary, and I wondered about your thoughts. And there's a lot of documentarians up here. Um, uh, and there's also a phrase pure documentary. Supposedly, Frederick Wiseman uh, doesn't inject himself, but of course, he. he edits this film. I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts on so-called documentary and truth. The question relates to documentary. Uh, you want to take that one? <laughs> here, here's the mic. Here's the mic. Oh, wow, well, that's not fair. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to say, except, um, I mean, it's a truism that there really is no such thing as, I mean, even Fred Wiseman, there's no such thing as, a, as an objective documentary, and Wiseman would agree with that, I'm sure. Um, this film, I think, happens to have a lot of mediation, because I think that the subject matter required it. Um, I think that it's, there's a lot of refraction going on here. Um, you know, Nancy's pulling things from, a, from all parts of a very complicated, spread out life, and it can't help but be multifaceted. And so you just have to simply spend a lot of time um, parsing it and putting it together. Uh, you don't just simply put a camera on the wall and record Susan Sontag's life. I should also say that we just thought so-called documentary was hilarious. I mean, yeah. It's hilarious, but I don't want to offend anyone else. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I'm a little overwhelmed by the intimacy of the film. For someone who, in her public life, kept all of that away from most people. And so you've made choices now in, the, in two documentaries to tell the truth, which the subject did not tell the truth. You can't leave Russell out of this. I'm sorry. That's all, all right. Been then it, it, years. All right. Bennett is here. Where are you, Bennett? You then let me, with me. let me just ask you about this, Nancy. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you've told the truth when her sister says what hurt her. You know, it's a very deep, moving moment, I think, for anyone who knows Susan. Um, and you, what you've done is corrected that in this film. And that must have gotten a lot of resistance from the people that you wanted to talk to. Could you talk about how you got here? actually fascinated by the contrast between the public Sontag and the private Sontag, and it wasn't just about her sexuality. I mean, this is a person who, you know, sort of in public pretended to have come from Zeus's head, you know, like <laughs> and in fact was a real person who had parents and a sister and, you know, had failings and was nervous about things and often felt like a failure. So I was just fascinated by the Iron Lady in public and the normal person in private, and, you know, so... I don't know that, I mean, she obviously was much more closeted than Rustin was, for example, or many other people were at that time. Um, I think it actually was much harder to be a woman and to be even somewhat out about your sexuality at that time. Um, I mean, unfortunately, you know, there's sexism in the world as well as, you know, homophobia. And I think that to be a lesbian intellectual in America still today in 2014 is more or less impossible. So. You know, I was afraid that people would um, dismiss this as too gay. In fact, there were people who said there are too many girlfriends in this movie. And I would say, I didn't sleep with the whole of them, you know. <laughs> you know, good for her. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but this is a problem with gay biography, actually. I mean, often we have, you know, heterosexual writers in America that someone makes a film about them. They might have been married for 20 years, or maybe they weren't. Maybe they were cheating on, you know, after wife spouse. But you know, many, many queer people of this era did not have one partner, you know, so do you take them all out? <laughs> I didn't think so, but thank you for your question. I'm sorry it was a little snarky. I was just joking around. But, um, but 
but Byron actually was much more open about his sexuality than Susan was. So I don't know if I really answered your question, though. We'll talk. Okay. For those who might not know, Byron was the subject of your previous Alice work. Alice wants to add something. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone just, else? Just for the, for the here. record, Sontag herself left her intimate diaries to the archive at UCLA with open access to all researchers. And her son published that first volume where she says, you know, I'm reborn, I'm queer, I'm reborn. So in a way, it was her choice. She did out herself beyond the grave, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, come on. We talked yeah. about Patricia Clarkson's voiceover is terrific. And could you talk a little bit about the process of that and directing Patricia? Well, I think I was a little intimidated to direct her. I should have directed her more, actually. But um, I, I, so you can't, you know, you're making a documentary, you can't have a casting call for great American actresses. So <laughs> I spent about three or four days, I'm not kidding, watching YouTube. And it was awful because most of the, what I was, I was trying to get their real voices and not their acting voices. So a lot of what I had to watch were, you know, they were on the Ellen Show and they were being interviewed about their, you know, charitable things or their puppies or something. It was just awful. I mean, you know, you, you want to like decide to leave America, go watch three days of YouTube, of, you know, daytime talk television. Um, but I just adore Patricia Clarkson's voice. I think she's an amazing actress. And so she was always my first voice. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, Susan Sarandon was another name that came up and, you know, I mean, you know, they were very, very fine actresses, and I just thought, I also wanted an actress who has, expresses her intelligence on screen. I mean, I don't make feature films, but I think that Patricia Clarkson is just an amazingly intelligent actress. So, you know, you go, you talk to the agent, you know, and I had to go to CAA and sort of beg, you know, can you do this? And I think she was really interested in this material, and I think she loved doing it. And obviously, this is a very exciting thing. And, you know, we did a bunch of takes of each one, and then she decided to go through the entire script kind of without stopping. And that was, I, I would say, it's, you know, breathtaking. I mean, Craig Sullivan was there. Where are you, Craig? Um, and it was just like watching, I mean, this is maybe a bad analogy for a human being, but it's like watching a thoroughbred, like, racing to the finish line of the Kentucky Derby when, you know, the, the animal's obviously going to win. It was just like, it was like, wow, because she took all the notes and all the things we talked about and just incorporated it all into that final run through of the script. It was amazing. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> How did you work with the composers? Well, we have the composers. Talk about the composers. <laughs> we talk about the composers. We loved working with you, Kate, and you, John. So thank you for this opportunity. It was totally fun. Um, the opportunity to work on a film about Susan Sontag doesn't happen often, and it's like a dream phone call that you get, right? Well, our phone call happened in a funny way. We were both fellows. Kate's and I were both fellows in the Sundance Documentary, um, in the Sundance Institute program, and I guess that was fall Wait, of the year ago. Right. No, you're not. <laughs> we're married, so I get so now, to now we get to argue in public. <laughs> <laughs> argue in public. <laughs> Kate's called me and said, "Are you going to Sundance as an advisor?" I said, "No, but my spouse is going as a fellow, yeah. and so you'll meet her." And then Nora was coincidentally assigned to the film. And she did an unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Blew everybody away. Fabulous. And so then, you know, when you came, now wait, you wait, take I need to just break <laughs> 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 so, so, so the So composers were throwing themselves at me, you know, like I was like saying, my, my dating life was so good. But, you know, they were throwing, and, I, and then one of my friends said, call Laura Cartman. And I'm like, another one? And I said, just call Laura Cartman. And Laura Cartman was in Valencia, Spain at the time. I had to email her. And... She was like, oh, great, great, we'll be back from Spain, whatever, whatever. And then I, two weeks later, I think, two weeks later, I get this invitation to the Music and Documentary Lab, and I'm paired with Nora, which, and I'm like, did you tell Nora? And I'm like, yes, yes, we told her. Um, and then at the end of this amazing five days of working together, Nora said, you should really hire my wife to do the score for your film. And I was like, what are you, like, sugar milk? So now you can <laughs> So we both did it. So we both, so we both scored the film, and a lot of those themes came out of our experience working at, Sont at Sundance on Sontag. And we, we found this way of working together. Laura and I worked together all the time on all kinds of things. We had never worked together in this capacity before. And this film, I think, really lent itself to collaboration. As I've been saying a lot, Sontag was many people. 
and she wasn't just one person. She was like, you know, ten people in one body. Mm -hmm. And there's this way in which the music wears many, many hats. And because of that, Laura and I were able to divvy certain things up. We we decided early on with Kate's to decide about kind of conceptually which voices we would have for certain instrumentations, for example. So there was this real corporeal, physical um, relationship Sexy. with sex and and the city and going out and culture and jazz. And I did that music. Lord did that music. <laughs> and the kind of percolating gestural chamber music that was much more kind of buttoned up, if you will, and there was much more... Um, uh, kind of founded in kind of this kind of classical um, uh, chamber music world that was much based in Sontag and the way that she um, actually early on talked about chamber music and actually I don't think that made it into the in, into the final cut but her talking about music we kind of had this chamber music sound and so the kind of percolating mind and the words and the energy and the electricity of that was another kind of music that I worked on and then this third world of music, which was all of this experimental, um, that we talked about a spectrum that on one side had war, and on another side had cancer. cancer and sickness. And so this world of experimental sounds lived in that um, continuum. Which came out of modernism, which came out of mid-century modernism, which was, of course, completely appropriate to Susan. And then there are these places where those stylistically intertwine. That's it. And that's it. That's all.